All right. I said we're going to preach uh, this evening on what hinders our uh, our prayer. Uh, what is it that keeps our prayer from being more effective than what it already is? And while you can probably make more list of things, uh, these are the four things I really felt like we should deal with. So because it's been a long day for you, I'll try to make them quick and simple. But I'm going to try to give you four things that hinder your prayer life. The first of those being sin. And our verse to begin with is Psalm 66:18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He's saying that if you have sin in your heart, uh, and you give place to it. To regard is to show reverence in some degree. Uh, is to acknowledge with appreciation. Uh, and so he says, if you have that sin in your heart, that you know it's there, but you just don't want to get rid of it, you're not willing to deal with that. You know, whatever sin may be in your life, uh, the, the first and easiest cause of why your prayer might be hindered is that now one of the best verses in the Bible for explaining why that is is your next verse in Isaiah 59.1 and 2 where he says behold the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid, your, hid His face from you, that He will not hear. If we are to be honest, most times the calls uh, of a of a dry relationship or dry fellowship between you and Christ. Uh, most time the cause of why it feels like he's just not talking back or listening. You know, why you can pick up your Bible and it just seems like the Spirit's not speaking to you. Why you can pray and it seems like you're just not getting through. More often than not, it is because of sin. It may not be because of major sin, but it is because we have let little things come between us and Him. See, Isaiah says that God has not changed in His ability. You know, God can still hear you just as good as He ever could. That's why when someone says that God cannot hear the prayer of lost people or He doesn't, you know that's not true. Even I will show you in a verse in a minute where a man in the Bible says that. And while some of what he says is true, you have to be careful with how he says it. Because God hears all things. He knows all things. He sees all things. We believe we have a God who is omniscient and omnipotent. And omnipresent. Uh, and so we believe that our God 
has to know all that's going on. Și noi credem că Dumnezeu nostru știe toate prin ceea ce trecem. So it's not that he doesn't hear you. Nu este că el nu te aude. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Este o diferență între a auzi și a asculta. And, you know, there's one thing, that, for example, you hear somebody talking. Este un alt lucru, de exemplu, auzi pe cineva You listen to the preacher. Uh, and you hear him speaking. You probably even hear the words to comprehend what they are. But whether you actually take that to your heart and process it is an entirely different story. That's why when I fuss about you know, playing with your cell phone, letting babies be a distraction and not just something you have to do, talking to the people behind you, <laughs> Uh, passing notes or anything else uh, is because what happens is you may hear it with your ears but you don't take it to your heart to let it actually do anything in fact some of you may be the reason why you haven't been getting as much across the past few years the past year at church Is it because God's not trying to speak to you? But because you're only listening with the ears and not the heart. Because you're so desperate to know what the biggest sale on AliExpress is right now. <laughs> Or to plan your next meal. Um, um, which on today is gluttony because you just ate. <laughs> But the point is you're sitting in God's house and you're distracted. And for many that's an excuse so that you don't have to hear what the preacher says. I want people to take notes. But there are some people that do it just so that they don't actually have to pay attention. That's not normal. Normally the people who take notes are the ones who are actually getting it. But I have family that does this, so that's why I have to be careful who I say. Uh, but my point of this is that if anybody should be able to understand how someone can hear you and know what you said without giving it any heart or concern, it's people who sit in church day you know, week after week and do the same thing. So this concept should not be formed. That when sin comes between you and God, He has not lost any of His ability. He still hears you. He knows what you're saying. But He is not giving a heart or concern to you. Because sin makes separation between you and God. One of the best verses for that is in Habakkuk. Where Habakkuk is trying to reconcile the idea of how a holy God uh, could use a wicked nation like Babylon uh, to punish his people Israel. And so he says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Now I'm giving you a verse not on your list just to make sure you have to pay attention. But what you have in that uh, is a statement of who God is. God is a holy God. He wants to help you. Uh, he wants to take care of you. You are his child. Now that doesn't mean he wants to give you all the nicest things in the whole world. But it does mean he wants to give you what's right and what is good for you. 
But many times we hinder him doing that. Not his ability, but his willingness. Because we are spoiled children and not good children. Now anyone with a child understands what I mean already. That I love to pick up my son. I love to give him nice things. But when his attitude is wrong, when he's crying because he wants it, when he's doing something bad, when he's not right, I can't give it to him. I want to, but I can't because it would be bad for him to do. I would be ruining him and telling him it's okay to do wrong and you still get right. Our God as a holy God takes the same stance with his children. Then he wants you to grow up. You know, to not be a child. To not be so spoiled. He wants you to not do things that are wrong. He doesn't want you to be in sin and be comfortable with that. And so he cannot reward while you're doing wrong. He cannot say, it's okay. I mean, I know you're over here doing things I told you not to do. But it's, I want you to have this nice new shiny toy. That's not how it works. When you do that as a parent, you are doing wrong. When you reward a child who is doing bad, you are doing bad as a parent. So how God, how could God be asked to do something that we understand is wrong? And that is to reward or you know, answer the prayers of a child who is in disobedience or sin. That's why Proverbs says uh, that when we turn away our ear from the hearing of His law, that even our prayer is an abomination to Him. Abomination means something disgusting. Something disgusting enough that you don't have any other word to describe it. In other words, he's saying the fact that you would reject what he has to say. That you would refuse to hear him. Then have the arrogance or audacity. Uh, to come before him and demand that he hears what you have to say and demand that he gives you what you want and you're not interested in what he has to say to you he says that level of arrogance is disgusting in his eyes Now, the passage I gave you said you have to be careful about is John 9.30 because this is someone's testimony. This is the blind man that Jesus healed him. That he was blind from birth. So let me read the verses to you. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing Uh, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, he heareth him. Him he heareth. Now, where you have to be careful in understanding this is do not take away from it that this is part of God's Word. But do also understand that this is the testimony of someone. That 
this man was brought before trial. Acest om a fost uh, uh, dus înaintea cercetărilor. Because they want to know how. Și de că și de că să știu uh, cum. How a man who was blind from birth could be healed. Cum un om care era orb din naștere putea să fie vindecat. And it's actually a beautiful story to watch. Este o poveste frumoasă să o o să o citești. Because you actually watch him coming to the realization of who Jesus is. Din cauza că privești că el vine la o realizare despre cine este Isus. The first time they ask him. Prima dată când îl întreabă. Uh, you know, oh, it's a good man. Spune că el este un om bun. Then oh, he's a prophet. Apoi că este un profet. Then surely he's from God. Atunci apoi îi spune că este That's the step we're at right now. Is it only someone who is from God could do a miracle like this? Now after this, he will go talk to Jesus himself. And Jesus will ask him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he'll say, well, who's that? I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he asked. Uh, and he says, that's me. Uh, and that's when he comes to the realization of just who Jesus is. So it's an incredible story uh, to see this man come to the realization of who Jesus is. Yeah. It's even an evidence that some people, when they come to the light, uh, it takes them a few times to really get it. Uh, and be able to trust on Christ. Now what he says though that pertains to this is a certain degree what we're talking about. And that's the fact that when you come to God as a sinner Not someone who is just a sinner by nature, but someone who is willfully in their sin, not willing to hear Him. That He's not willing to hear you. Until you fix the problem, There's nothing to be done. Because he didn't change. The problem is not on his side. He didn't sin against you. He didn't break some commandment that violates your law. And even if he did, that would mean your law is in contradiction to his. But he owes you no apology. If you don't see how ridiculous that concept is, that it even needs to be explained, then know that there's a video going around right now of a preacher, preach, or so-called preacher, preaching how that he forgave Jesus because some Christians offended him. So, I mean, if you put it in context, you start to see why it's ridiculous. He who could do no wrong needs never to be forgiven. But for you and I, when there's wrong in the relationship, it's our fault. There's an old story that the Romanians will know. Because they've been with me long enough they've heard it. Uh, but there's a story of a man and a woman riding in the car together. And they're an older couple. And you know, the man's driving the car. The woman's sitting on her side, he's sitting on his. And she begins to think. And she looks at him and says, you know, when we first got married, I always sat right beside him. Yeah, you know, we were always holding each other's hands. Uh, we were always leaning on each other. Uh, and we just always, you know, we were together whenever we would ride. 
But now you sit over there on your side. And I sit over here on my side. And so she asked her husband, what happened? And so her husband thinks about it for a second. And he looks at it. And he says, well, I, I didn't move. I'm still in the driver's seat. <coughs> He didn't slide over, she slid over. I mean, he's driving the car, he couldn't have went anywhere else if you missed that part of the story. So if there's a gap, a distance between them, uh, then the problem is not that the driver moved, it's that she slid over. If there is a gap in your relationship with God, if there's a problem in the fellowship, then you can be assured that it's from your side. Because he has not changed. He said that he is God that changes not according to the And so what you have at this point, is that one of the easiest things you can fix in your prayer life is to not give place to iniquity in your heart. To never let any sin be so precious that you won't let it go. That you won't bring it to God and confess it in order to fix the fellowship. The second thing that for alliteration's purposes I said skepticism, unbelief. Uh, but we just mean that lack of faith. Uh, because James says in James chapter 1 and verse 6 but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now, these verses started off nice. He's telling you if you lack wisdom, ask for God, He'll give it to you freely. But then He turns to this. And He says, if you're going to ask, don't ask with any wavering in your faith. You know, with shaky faith. You better make sure that you're strong in your faith and that you really believe that He can do it. He said, because if you don't really believe God can do it, you know, if, if your faith is shaking at all, he said, don't think you're going to receive anything. Now, this is the easiest thing probably to explain. What does Hebrews 11, 16? That Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to him must believe that he is, and that he is able, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You want to get something from God. You know, you want to come to him in prayer and ask him to meet your needs. You want to come to him in prayer and ask him for help. Then you better have confidence that he can do it. Because God's not like some of us. Some of us, when you doubt us, it makes us more motivated and we fight harder to prove ourselves. Now, some of you, when somebody doubts you, you react, uh, you react by not doing anything. You use it as an excuse not to do anything at all. Now, while I would traditionally want to say bad of you for that. Biblically, I can't really say that. Because God says if you come to Him that way. 
If you come to him asking him to do something, but at the same time doubting his ability to do it, or his goodness to do it, or willingness, uh, then he says he's not going to do it. He says, if you're going to come to him, you better believe he is, he is able, you know, he is God, he is capable, that he is God and he's capable. Uh, and that he is the rewarder of those that seek him. So, I mean, this is something that's clearly defined in the Bible. We quote these verses often. Anything that's got a faith is seen. As we said, without faith it's impossible to please him. The just shall live by his faith. I mean, we, we cannot overestimate the importance of faith. But whereas you might ask me to do something, and I don't know if you actually have confidence in me. God actually knows your heart. And he says, you better come with faith unwavering. I give you Mark 11.22 to go with this. And Jesus answering saith unto him, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall... No, not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now again, don't take this out of context because I'll give you God's will as being part of this in a moment. But the clear teaching of this is faith. What is his opening statement? Have faith in God. He says, if you have faith in God, and you ask Him to cast the mountain into the sea, He says it will be done. I don't want you to negate God's will. Because when Jesus was told to do certain things by the devil, He quoted, it is written not to tempt the Lord your God. But that's not what's being addressed. What is being addressed is that if we truly believe, we have a God who is able to do anything. And so if we come to Him in faith, as I said this morning, He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we may ask or think. That means there's nothing you could ever think of. Therefore, nothing you could ever ask for that would be too complicated for him to do. You know, you cannot exceed his ability. The only thing you could ever do is ask for something that contradicts his will. You know, that's where you're going to start running into stuff that God wants to do, not can't do. <coughs> now, in the sense that he can't go against his own nature, yes, you have a semantics argument. But that would still be getting distracted from the main point here. And that's the fact that we have a God. And he says, I'm able to do more than you could ever imagine. But if you want me to do it, you have to believe that. But I'm not going to do it if you're just asking for it, hoping maybe I can do it. 
Că nu voi face dacă tu doar vei cerea și vei uh, spune voi uh, că poate vei face. Then moving to the third thing. We have selfishness. And I move into this because this is where his will comes into it. He says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Uh, come ye, come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask a miss that ye may consume it upon your own lust. According to James, the reason we don't have what we need, or let's even say what we want, is because we would rather fight for it than ask for it. He says, where do the fightings and wars and all this stuff come from? He says, because the lust that is inside of you is fighting even with inside of you to get it. He's saying that because you would rather go and fight to have your way than to come to God and ask for His way. Now, He gives two points in that. One is that you don't ask and the other is that when you do ask, you ask for the wrong stuff. You ask for the things that your lust is trying to consume. You know, then when it comes to the right thing, You don't ask. Now, there could be multiple reasons for that. I would say in the context, there's two. One is because you don't want what is right. Uh, and the other is because when you do want it, you would rather get it your way than God's way. Oh, I, I want a wife so much. But instead of praying and asking God for a wife, you go date every girl you find, commit fornication and many things God condemns, and hope that just maybe you find the one you like. So he says you ask, you don't have because you don't have. You know, you don't get because you're not looking for the woman that God God wants you looking for just whatever makes you happy. So you can apply this to jobs or anything. We want to have a nice house. So instead of trusting God to provide for us in His time, and praying and asking Him for that, we, you know, go and get involved in jobs that maybe he never asked us to. We get so busy that we don't have time to read our Bible and pray anymore. Eventually we start getting out of church because of it. And then at some point we start compromising into things we never thought we would do. Now, there's an opportunity to move up in this job if I'll just go get drunk with the other guys. And it usually doesn't start there. It starts with you knowing that no corrupt communication should proceed forth from your lips. But in order to impress your new boss, 
You sit around and tell a bunch of filthy jokes with all the other guys. But little by little, you start getting away from God. Because instead of doing it God's way and letting Him give it in His time, you would rather fight to have it your way and do it in your time. So you don't ask. Because either you don't want what he actually wants you or because you'd rather do it your way. Now, the other thing that he mentions is that when you do ask, he still doesn't give it because you're not asking for the right things. You're asking for things that you're lusting after but not things that are necessarily good for you. Or I would even say right for you. Oh my God, I just so much want a Tesla. God, please give me this Tesla. I have to poke somebody every once in a while. But you're praying desperately for things that they and themselves may not be bad. But it's not what God wants for you. Uh, you're praying desperately because you like this person and you want a relationship with them. But they're not God's for you. So the only way you're ever going to get that relationship is if you start trying to do it your way. Because he says you can ask him all you want, he's not going to give it. Uh, but at some point you'll stop asking him and you'll take it in your hands. So he says your prayers are not being heard because you're not asking for what God's telling you to ask. Your verse there in Matthew, what did Jesus tell his disciples? I mean, you have that example prayer. He says that you should pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if you want a model of what the heart of your prayer life should be, it's like what Jesus prayed in the garden. That, you know, Lord, if you're willing, let this cut pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So, you know, maybe there's stuff that you want. But you don't know if it's God's will. Okay, you can pray. And say, God, if you're willing, would you give me this? But you often have to be willing to accept that if it's not His will, it's not right for you. And instead of fighting and warring for it, and instead of letting your lust be your God instead of the Holy Spirit, at some point you have to give in and go where He leads you. Learn to let Him show you what is right. For Ken, that means realizing it's God's will for him to live in Belgium, not God. I had to let the manager know he's not the only one I put. <laughs> But my point of this is that at some point, we have to be willing to give in and say, okay, God, if this is, whatever you want, I will do that. Because the most important part of prayer, other than faith, other than being right with God, is that that prayer is according to the will of God. I'll be honest, I don't know how you would stack which one is more important than the other. I believe that they go right there hand in hand together. God wants to give you. But it has to be what's right. Uh, it has to be that you trust Him. Uh, and you need to be right with Him. Because He cannot bless sin. 
So the most the most important verse I'll give you about this idea is first John 5 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he us. So all these verses when it's talking about I hear you, I hear you, if you believe, I hear you. Remember that he does hear you, but it also has to be according to his will. He wants to give you what is best. But best is not always what you want. And so he cannot give you something that is directly going to take you out of the will of God. Again, you may be praying, God, I just I like this girl, I wish she would marry me. But that doesn't mean it's God's will. No matter how much you want it. And so you can pray until you're blue in your face. But he's not going to give it to you because that would put you and her both out of his will. You can pray for that job that pays more. But for some reason God may not want you over there. God has his place where he wants you. And he has a desire for your life. And he's not going to give you things that contradict that. So then finally we come to strife. This is the one though that most people don't realize. 1 Peter 3.7 is convicted. If you're a husband, this should convict you. If you're a wife, it should do it also. If it doesn't, then you're too arrogant to realize your own problems. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of God, that your prayers be not hindered. You understand what God is telling you? He's saying, men, if you're not right with your wife, you know, if you husbands have some issue with your own wife, then your prayer life is going to be hindered by that. And I would say that it applies to wives having problems with their husbands. You know, if you're not loving her the way Christ loved the church and gave himself, if you're not treating her the way that God has commanded you to do, if wives are not being in submission to their husbands, as God commanded, you know, if you have that rebellion that you're not willing to listen to the man that God gave you, knowing that he told you to do it. And if you said traditional vows, you even vowed to do it. And even if you didn't say the traditional vows, if you understood the Bible, you knew what you were getting into when you vowed to marry that man. God said if there's a problem there, it will hinder your prayer life. Now, I believe the reason for that is a symbol. Uh, and it's what he explains in your last verses there. Matthew 5, 23. Therefore, if thou bring me thy gift to the altar, and there, and there remembers that thy brother hath aught against thee, 
De aceea, dacă îți aduci darul la altar și acolo îți amintești că fratele tău are ceva împotriva ta, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. When your heart is wrong with other people, not only is that going to be in direct contradiction to God's commandments anyway, but God is teaching that you cannot come to Him with the right heart. If you have all to get somebody else, that means that all of you people who got mad during the song picking time, that if you want to have a good prayer life before you go to bed tonight, if you want to be right with God, we have to make that right. So if I need to apologize to you like I did to someone else, I'm not too proud to do that. But if you got a problem, we need to fix it before you go to bed tonight. God said, don't let the sun go down on your right. He says, if you're going to bring something to Him, and when you're getting ready to give an offering to Him, you realize that there's a problem in your heart. That you're upset with someone. That you're just, you're not willing to let go of what they did to you. Or that you did something wrong to them. Either way, he says he doesn't want your gift until you go fix the problem. Let's say it's your tithe, something you owe him. He says he doesn't want it until you go fix the problem. And you see that with what he's saying about your prayer life being hindered, when there's a problem between you and your spouse, that the same thing is applied. That if you want to be able to have a healthy prayer life, then if you and somebody else have an issue, you need to fix it. God says, you know, put the offering down, go fix it, and then come back and do it. So fellas, men, uh, if you've got a problem with your wife, before you leave church tonight, you need to get that right. If you've not been the husband her that God's called you to be, then you need to apologize to her before you leave. Otherwise, God says your prayers are hindered or even empty, maybe. Ladies, if you've sinned against your husband, you've not been uh, reverent in that way that you should. You're still having a hard time with that submitting to his authority thing. Then God says, don't expect your relationship to be right with him if you're not right with your husband. So if you really want your prayer life to be right, you get it right with him before you go home. Get it right with each other. So get it right with each other. If you as a brother or sister sitting here in church tonight, have an issue with somebody else. God says you get it right before you even bother coming to Him in prayer. He says your prayers will be hindered. It's going to cut back how much He's willing to listen to you. 
when you have that unforgiving spirit. Atunci când aveți acest spirit de neiertat. That bitterness, that pride. Această mărăciune, această mândrie. The Bible says that without pride there's no contention. Biblia spune că fără mândrie nu este ceartă. You can't have fighting unless there's pride. Nu este mândrie nu este mândrie fără ceartă. Let me make that clear. Să fie mai clar. I certainly sometimes I may hurt people's feelings. Eu uneori poate rănesc pe cineva. But you realize that's not possible unless you have pride. That's not to take away my responsibility. But that's to show you that unless there's pride involved, you cannot get your feelings hurt. There was a preacher that every time somebody would feel like they might have hurt his feelings. Uh, and they would come and apologize to him. His answer was always the same. That's not a problem. You can't hurt me. You can't hurt a dead man. Now what he's talking about is this. That he died to self. And if you die to self, your feelings can't get hurt. Because only by pride can we continue. So my point is this. You got somebody that you just can't forgive them because they hurt you so much. Then no matter how wrong they may be, there's a problem on your side that problem is pride. Doesn't God say he resists the proud but he gives grace to them? Doesn't he tell that unforgiving servant that when he refused to forgive the small debt after he'd been forgiving so much doesn't he condemn him for that? Doesn't he tell us that even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us, we'll also forgive one another? You will not be right with God if you're wrong with other Christians. And especially with your husband and wife. So until you get it right with them, you cannot expect to have a healthy, fervent prayer life. So if you want to stop praying your own prayers, any sin that's in your life, you confess it to God and get rid of it. Let go of all selfishness that keeps you from coming to Him seeking His will. <laughs> Truly believe and trust that He is able. <laughs> and make sure that you're not holding alt against someone else. If there's a problem with someone else, get it right. If for no other reason, get it right for your own relationship with God. 